Previously on The Secret Sits, Ken McElroy had spent years terrorizing the town of Skidmore, Missouri. Ken's wife Trina and their baby are being kept in a safe house in Maryville, but they would not stay safe from Ken McElroy for long. This story is only going to get crazier from here. Are you ready? Here we go. Welcome to The Secret Sits. I'm your host, John Dodson. Join us every Thursday as we uncover the secrets behind the world's most fascinating true crime cases. You can find all episodes of The Secret Sits for free on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you are hearing, reach out to us on Instagram and Facebook at The Secret Sits Podcast or on Twitter at Secret Sits Pod. Now, on with our story. Ken quickly ascertained where Trina and the baby had been placed with a foster family, and he took to parking outside of their house for hours at a time. This family called the police, but when officers showed up and spoke with Ken, they told the family that he was perfectly within his rights to sit in his car and stare at their home. Ken found out the names of the homeowners who were fostering his underage wife and child, and he began a stream of threatening and intimidating phone calls to the family. Each time Ken called the house, it raised Trina's level of anxiety and panic. During one of these phone calls, Ken offered to make a deal, a girl for a girl. Ken then went on as he told the woman that he knew what school bus her daughter took to school each day, a blatant threat that he would kidnap the woman's actual daughter, and then they could trade a girl for a girl. Trina had additional meetings with the county prosecutor, and she told him about all of the times she had been with Ken McElroy in the St. Joseph Motel over the past three years, starting from when she was just 13 years old. After these interviews, the prosecutor added eight additional felony molestation charges against Ken. Then Dick McFadden got to work. Dick had the charges split into two separate trials. He pursued venue changes for each trial, and he had trial dates reset time and time again, all stalling tactics to keep his client out of jail longer and longer. After a year of this runaround, Trina told her foster family that she was going to move out of their home and move in with her grandmother. The family was not comfortable with this arrangement and immediately raised their suspicions, but they were just her foster family and Trina was free to do as she pleased. Less than one month after Trina moved out, Ken walked into Dick's office and asked him a simple question. What happens if I marry Trina? The problem was that Ken was still legally married to his second wife, Sharon, a girl he had not lived with for several years now. Conveniently, the very next day, Sharon showed up at Dick's office asking for a divorce from Ken McElroy. The attorney drew up a simple dissolution of their marriage. Now Ken was available to marry Trina, but what if she did not want to marry him? Trina was still just 15 years old at this time, so legally she could get married, but only with her parents' consent. After having had their house burned to the ground and their family dog shot by Ken, Trina's mother reluctantly signed the affidavit to authorize her underage daughter's marriage to Ken McElroy. A local judge did a quick wedding with only Dick McFadden there as a witness. As soon as this wedding was finished, Dick called the county prosecutor to inform him that his only witness against Ken McElroy was now Ken's wife, and therefore she could not be compelled to testify against him in court. The prosecutor had no choice but to drop all charges against Ken. 
After this, Ken, Trina, and Alice resumed their tortured life they had been living together. The trio would drive around in three separate pickup trucks, like a military convoy, and each one of them watched out for the other. A local Skidmore farmer named Romaine Henry was working in his equipment shed on the afternoon of July 27th, 1976, a regular Tuesday, just like all of the rest. Then Romaine heard several gunshots, and he could tell these shots had to have come from somewhere on his 1,000-acre farm. Romaine climbed into his pickup, and he began to drive around his property just to make sure nothing was amiss. Romaine saw Ken McElroy's truck parked on the gravel road which bordered his property. Romaine pulled closer to the truck, and as he did, Ken stepped from behind the truck, brandishing a shotgun. Romaine stopped his truck, and Ken jerked the passenger side door open and shoved his shotgun into the cab of the truck, pointed directly at Romaine. Ken yelled, Were you the dirty son of a bitch over at my place in a white Pontiac? Romaine was shocked, and he had no idea what Ken was talking about. He stammered out an answer to Ken. He told him that he did not know what he was talking about. Ken shouted obscenities at Romaine, and he fired his shotgun. Romaine was shocked as the buckshot tore into his torso. He flung open his driver's side door, and he tried to exit his vehicle. This was the only way to get out of the way of the gun. But before he could get out of the truck, Ken fired again. This blast of pellets struck Romaine in his right cheek and forehead. In the split second that Romaine exited his vehicle, Ken's gun jammed. Romaine used this opportunity to jump back into his truck and he sped away. After he returned to his house, his wife drove him to the Maryville Hospital. The sheriff's office picked up Ken the following day and charged him with assault with the intent to kill. Ken simply said he was not there and he had no idea what Romaine was talking about. Ken's attorney used all of his typical tactics change of venue requests, and repeated delays for the trial. And while Ken's attorney was doing his part, Ken was doing his typical part as well. He parked outside of Romaine's house, and he would just sit there, staring at the house, an attempt at intimidation. Romaine and his wife said that Ken sat outside of their home at least 100 times between Ken's arrest and the trial. Romaine made complaints to the sheriff, who said he would talk to Ken, but the stalking behavior just continued. When the case finally made its way to trial, a newly elected district attorney proved no match for the high-powered private attorney of Ken McElroy. Romaine sat in the witness stand, and he testified that Ken McElroy was the man who had shot him. Two of Romaine's neighbors testified that they saw Ken fleeing the scene in his pickup truck just after the shooting. Then, Dick put two witnesses on the stand. Both of these men were raccoon hunters, and they both made claims that they were with Ken McElroy on the day of the shooting. And they were all the way across town from Romaine's farm. The jury acquitted Ken on all charges. The good citizens of Skidmore were flabbergasted at this verdict, and Ken McElroy paraded around town talking about how he should have killed Romaine in the first place. A few months after the trial had ended in Ken's acquittal, Romaine was on his tractor working on his fall harvest. As he tended his fields, Romaine noticed a truck parked at the edge of the field he was currently working on. As he grew closer, Romaine recognized the truck as belonging to Ken McElroy. Romaine then noticed the stocky figure of Ken crouched behind a gate. Ken was holding a long rifle that was aimed squarely at Romaine's tractor. The roaring noise from the giant diesel engine was not enough sound to drown out the report of the rifle as it rang out in the open fields. Ken then stood up straight and walked back to his truck 
he racked his rifle and just drove off. He was certain that he had proved his point. Anytime he wanted to, Ken could end your life, so watch out. The shooting of Romaine Henry resulted in no retaliation from the people of Skidmore, but the series of events that would lead to Ken McElroy's death was all set into motion by the theft of a 10 cent piece of candy. It was a hot Friday afternoon on April 25th, 1980, when several of Ken McElroy's litter of children stopped into the B&B grocery store in town to get some candy. There was some apparent confusion at the cash register, and one of the little girls began to walk out of the store with candy she had not paid for. The store clerk called after the children, like the woman in Home Alone. Son, you have to pay for that toothbrush, you know. Something innocuous like that. Well, one of the older girls was very upset that this clerk had yelled after her sister. She took the candy from the small girl and slammed it down onto one of the shelves, and the small girl began to sob as they walked out of the store. Almost as soon as the door to the store closed, another of the older girls burst back into the store, yelling at the store clerk, Nobody accuses my little sister of stealing. The owners of the B&B grocery, Lois and Bo Bowenkamp, attempted to resolve the disagreement with a simple discussion. But the McElroy family had too many of Ken's social traits, and they could not be spoken with rationally. The teenaged girl told the couple that her family would never shop in their store again. Lois responded by telling the girl that they were no longer welcome in the store, period. Ken McElroy arrived at the store about 20 minutes later, and he walked into the store with his pocket knife already out and in his right hand. Trina followed Ken into the store, shouting obscenities and threats at Lois. Trina told the woman that she was going to whip her ass. Lois Bowencamp attempted to keep her calm, and she explained to Ken and Trina that no one had accused the little girl of stealing. It was simply a mistake. The candy had just not been rung up at the register. After hearing this, surprisingly, Ken and Trina seemed to calm down. Ken then asked Lois for a pack of Camel cigarettes. Lois took in a deep breath and stood tall as she declined to sell Ken the cigarettes. As she had previously stated, the McElroys were now barred from her store. That night, Ken sat in his truck just outside of the B&B grocery store, and he stared. The Bowen Camps closed up their store for the evening, just like they did every evening, and they went to their car. The couple drove home to their house located just on the outskirts of town. As the couple attempted to enjoy their evening together, they kept noticing Ken McElroy's truck driving very slowly past their house, back and forth, back and forth. Lois phoned a sheriff's deputy she knew personally, and the deputy told her, don't worry about it, he won't do nothing. A few days after this, Ken McElroy approached Lois and offered her $100 cash if she would challenge Trina to a street fight as a way to settle their disagreement. Lois laughed at this and told Ken that it was absolutely an absurd idea. The next day, Lois looked out of her kitchen window to find Ken and Trina standing right there outside of her home, where they expected her to come outside and fight. Lois thought not. She phoned for the police and a deputy was dispatched. Ken heard the call on his police scanner from his truck and he and Trina left before the deputy could arrive. Lois told the officer that she wanted to file a formal complaint, but the officer told her that Ken was perfectly within his legal rights to be there, and there was nothing they could do about it. The problem was, Lois thought, that Ken McElroy never left a conflict unfinished. He always had to have the final word. The couple began to live on edge all of the time, when they were at their store, 
The soft jingle of the bell at the front door sent chills down their spines. Was it Ken coming to exact his revenge? While they were at their home, the sound of a car crunching the gravel driveway made them run to the windows to see if Ken was at their house. They were living their lives in fear. And this lasted for a month, until the night of May 29th, when Ken and Trina appeared once again right outside of the Bone Camp's home. Lois peered through the window as Ken exited his truck, shotgun in hand. He walked around to the front of his truck, aimed his shotgun to the sky, and he fired two shots into the night sky. Ken then got back into his truck and he drove away. 30 minutes later, Ken drove by the house again, and he fired another warning shot. The following morning, Lois Bowenkamp decided that enough was enough, and she drove down to the Nottoway County Sheriff's Office in Maryville to file a report. Sheriff Roger Cronk told Lois that he would file the report, and it would be reviewed by the county prosecutor. The sheriff then told her that she and Bo should keep an eye on Ken McElroy, which just made Lois laugh. But after Lois left the sheriff's office, Sheriff Cronk did nothing with Lois's report. He did not even file it. He did not talk to Ken McElroy. He did absolutely nothing. Two nights after this incident, Ken returned to the Bowen Camp's house and fired more gunshots outside. Lois and Bo hid inside of their own house, terrorized by the town bully. By Missouri state law, Ken was harassing, intimidating, threatening, and assaulting this couple. But law enforcement would do nothing to help them, except for continuously telling the couple to keep an eye out for Ken. At this point, most of the residents knew about the problem the bone camps were having with Ken, but they were also powerless to stop it. Bo Bowenkamp had only lived in Skidmore for about eight years. He was not as baked in as many of the other residents in town. Bo was about to turn 70 years old, and he was easing into his retirement. Bo stood a whopping six foot five, but his demeanor was quiet and demure. Lois was a Skidmore local, and she was just 50 years old, 20 years younger than her husband, and she was known to be spirited and blunt. During the evening hours of July 8th, 1980, Bo drove into town to his grocery store. He needed to meet a repairman to fix his wonky air conditioner. As Bo waited on the repairman to show up, he stood in the back door of the store cutting up cardboard boxes with a meat knife. Suddenly, and out of nowhere, Ken McElroy was standing right in front of the old man. The two men had some words, and Bo turned to go back into his store. As he looked back, he was now face to face with the business end of Ken's shotgun. The 70-year-old man made an attempt to run, but as he turned, Ken pulled the trigger, and the towering man crumpled to the ground. Ken fled the scene, and lucky for Bo, only a few minutes passed before a young boy happened upon the open door to the back of the store. The boy discovered Bo on the ground. His head, neck, and body were washed with a spray of crimson blood. This boy raised the alarm, and first responders raced to the scene. Bruce Richards, a police officer from Maryville, was the first person on scene, and Bruce asked Bo, who shot you? Bo Bowenkamp, still clinging to life, answered Ken McElroy. A few hours after the shooting, the police picked up Ken McElroy, who claimed once again that he knew nothing about the shooting. He wasn't there. He didn't do it. Ken called his good buddy Dick, and he was released on $30,000 bond the following day, and Ken took Trina out to the D&G Tavern for some beers. Bo spent 10 days recovering in the hospital. The gunshot wound to his neck was severe, but he had survived. As the weeks passed and Bo left the hospital, 
Ken kept up his usual antics, continuing to administer his intimidations on Bo Bowen camp. After a local minister came a Colin to offer his sympathy to Bo, Ken began making threatening phone calls to the minister, and he told the minister to mind his own business. Ken always made it his purpose to isolate the people he terrorized. He did not allow those around them to even offer sympathy. Lois Bowenkamp began writing letters to anyone she thought could help them escape this daily blanket of terror. In a letter to the governor, Lois asks, Are we to live in fear for the rest of our lives? Please help us see justice done. Ken was spreading his own version of events around town, telling anyone who would listen that Bo had come at him with a knife and he had only fired in self-defense. His version of events was believed by almost no one in town. They all knew that Bo Bowenkamp was a gentle, passive man who wouldn't hurt a fly. Bo had already admitted that he was in fact holding a knife when he was shot, but that was due to him cutting up the cardboard boxes. But Ken McElroy would not stop. One night, Ken happened upon a part-time town marshal named David Dunbar, and he asked David if he was going to testify against him in the Bowen Camp case. David said that he would if he had to. This enraged Ken, and he said, I'll kill anybody who would put me in jail. Ken turned around and pulled his shotgun from his truck, and he pointed the double barrels directly at David Dunbar. David, somehow, miraculously began to calm down Ken, and then David walked to his patrol car to radio the sheriff's office. David told them what had just happened, and they responded, Don't provoke him. Nothing we can do. Keep an eye on him. And this to a part-time town marshal who made $3,000 a year. So, on Monday morning, as soon as the Skidmore Town Hall opened, David Dunbar walked in and turned in his badge. Good for you, Dunbar. Good for you. Ken had also called in threats to two other state troopers who had arrested him. One officer named Richard Stratton said that while he was at work, Ken McElroy would slowly drive back and forth past his house, terrorizing his wife, who was at home. All while Ken was out running amok, His attorney, Dick McFadden, was doing his thing, attempting to delay yet another trial for his best client. The venue changed to Bethany, Missouri, which is 75 miles east of Skidmore. And when all of the trivial delays came to their ultimate end, the trial began on June 25, 1981. The trial was simply laid out by a young prosecutor, only three years out of law school. Bo said Ken assaulted him with a shotgun. Ken said he fired in self-defense because Bo attacked him with a knife. This was a very he said, he said case. So magically, Ken's legal team found an eyewitness to the attack. This just so happened to be a woman in Ken's raccoon hunting circle, but I am sure this is just a coincidence. This woman testified that she was passing Skidmore's main street at the very second the shooting took place. And she saw, with her own little peepers, Bo lunge viciously at Ken, and then Ken had to defend himself. When asked, she could not come up with a reason. It had taken her nine months to come forward to tell this story. After the closing arguments, the jury left to deliberate and they quickly returned a verdict of guilty of assault for Ken McElroy. The jury had several different verdicts they could render, and the heftier of these carried up to life in prison. The venue was so far from Skidmore that none of these jurors knew anything about Ken McElroy, and it is illegal in court to bring forth this man's prior history of behavior. And because the jury knew nothing about Ken outside of this case, 
they chose to convict him on second-degree assault with only two years in prison. After the verdict was read, the judge released Ken McElroy on bail, pending a routine 25-day appeal window, and the monster was released back into the wild. Four days after his conviction, Ken walked into the D&G Tavern carrying an M1 assault rifle with a sharpened bayonet attached to the end of the barrel. Everyone in the tavern breathed a sigh of relief when they were informed that Ken was just looking to sell the gun and not use it. As Ken sat at the bar with his wife Trina, he described how he wanted to finish what he had started with Bo Bowen Camp. He pulled a loaded clip from his pocket and slammed it into the gun. Ken stood up and demonstrated what he wanted to do to Bo. He wanted to shoot the man in the head and then use the bayonet to carve him up like a turkey dinner. Because of this disgusting display of toxic masculinity mixed with psychosis, Pete Ward, a local retired farmer, stormed out of the tavern. Pete went and got his adult sons and a few other men from around town, and they set up watch teams to keep an eye on Bo Bowenkamp's property and the Bowenkamps themselves. Pete, along with three other men from the bar, that night all signed an affidavit to what they had witnessed. Not that it mattered. The young prosecutor attempted to use this affidavit to have Ken's bail revoked, This was an urgent matter. A man convicted of assault stated in public that he was going to finish the job. And the judge decided to not even hear the prosecutor's protests for another five days. This judge was from Bethany, not Skidmore. He had no idea how terrible Ken McElroy truly was. So the people from the town of Skidmore planned to travel in mass to Ken's hearing in Bethany. They wanted to go before the judge and protest Ken's continued freedom to terrorize their town. But as the townsfolk woke up on the morning of the hearing, July 10th, and they began meeting at the Skidmore Legion Hall to go together, they received word that the hearing had been postponed until the 20th because Ken's lawyer, Dick, had a conflict. After they learned that the hearing was postponed, many people left to go back home, especially the women, because a woman's work is never done. A lot of the men stayed at the hall, and as more and more men showed up and began participating in this rump session, they decided to call Sheriff Estes to come over from Maryville to attend this meeting. Sheriff Estes agrees, and he drives right over to the Legion Hall. When the sheriff arrived, the men began to grill him on how he was keeping their town safe. And this is when the sheriff suggested that they watch out for themselves. When Sheriff Estes talked to the papers, he said they wanted to know what they could do to protect themselves. Basically, the questions concerned could they be allowed to patrol each other's homes and farms. But a neighborhood watch would not be necessary because the people of this town were about to permanently dispose of their problem and no one was ever going to talk about it. Shots rang out as the crowd of angry men surrounded Ken's brown truck parked on Main Street. Trina flew from the truck screaming her head off and she was ushered to safety. A task force of 20 three officers from six different agencies in Missouri were put together in Skidmore. This task force made a list of 35 men who were known to be at the scene of the murder. Not one of them would talk. Next, the task force set up a tip line. It did not receive one single phone call, except from the media. Six days after the shooting, on July 20th, Ken McElroy was interred at the St. Joseph's Cemetery. The task force turned over its feeble findings to the county prosecutor, and the prosecutor met with Sheriff Estes 
to convene a coroner's inquest. This would consist of a six-person jury. The jury heard evidence from law enforcement, Trina McElroy, Skidmore Mayor Steve Peter, and others. The grand jury ruled that Ken McElroy died from bullets fired by a person or persons unknown. The jury issued no arrest warrants due to a lack of evidence. After this initial grand jury, a state grand jury was impaneled three weeks later. This grand jury had 15 meetings over five weeks. These 12 jurors heard all of the same evidence that the original jury had heard, and they heard from the same witnesses, including Trina McElroy, who stated that she had seen Del Clement holding a rifle as she fled the truck for her own safety. This jury also heard forensic evidence pertaining to Ken's wounds. He had been struck by at least one 22 caliber bullet, and another round from an 8mm rifle was also located inside of Ken's body. Both of these size caliber weapons matched shell casings that police recovered from the scene. Due to this evidence, police were able to forensically put the shooting together. One of the shooters was positioned in the spot where Trina claimed to have seen Del Clement. On September 25th, the grand jury's investigation was closed out, once again with no indictments. Trina had made the same claims in both grand juries about Del Clement. However, they could not get one single person to corroborate her claims. Due to the stress Trina was under with the shooting taking place and seeing her husband gunned down, the jury would not bring an indictment based on her testimony alone. The U.S. Department of Justice ordered the FBI to open an investigation into this shooting. FBI agents flooded the town and interviewed witnesses through the winter, and then in the spring of 1982, a federal grand jury heard the same testimony from the same witnesses as the first two grand juries. In September, the FBI closed their case with no indictments. Before they left town, the FBI announced that they had turned over newly discovered evidence to the local prosecutor. The prosecutor read through the FBI's briefs and stated, after careful consideration and evaluation, I have determined that there is not current sufficient evidence with which to establish guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And with that, he closed the case, and it has remained closed ever since. In 1984, Ken McElroy's attorney, Dick McFadden, filed a $5 million wrongful death lawsuit against Sheriff Estes, the mayor, and Del Clement on behalf of Trina McElroy. To make this lawsuit go away, the three named defendants settled out of court for $17,600. The county paid $12,600. The Skidmore's Sheriff's Office paid $2,000, and Del Clement paid $3,000. No one in this suit had to admit any guilt in the death of Ken McElroy. Trina McElroy remarried and moved out of the town of Skidmore. She died in 2012. Ken McElroy ended up producing 15 children with the four women that he was either married to or dating. Those children have now moved on with their lives, and they dot the landscape of Northwest Missouri. The young prosecutor on this case is still practicing law to this day, as is Dick McFadden. Bo Bowenkamp passed away 10 years after all of this mess, and his wife Lois went on to serve the Skidmore Town Council. As the years passed, Lois continued to give sound bites to reporters who wandered into the town to investigate this case. Lois will typically say, the town is well rid of him, justice is served. Lois continues to harbor resentment toward the criminal justice system that had failed her and her husband in their time of need. She told the Kansas City Star in 2001, if they had done something to tell him he could not keep violating other person's rights, it might have made a difference. 
but maybe that is simply wishful thinking, Lois. Dunbar, the town marshal, who left his position after the sheriff's office refused to protect him, said, It's really a shame about the Silverado. That was a really nice truck. The population of Skidmore has dwindled over the years, down to only about 245 residents, people who just want to move on with their lives. It has now been 41 years since the good citizens of Skidmore decided that enough was enough, and they took the law into their own hands. Ken McElroy was the living embodiment of a nightmare, and they just wanted the nightmares to stop. The small town of Skidmore, Missouri, will forever be associated with this vigilante murder. Who actually pulled the trigger? Who murdered a man in broad daylight with almost 45 witnesses on hand? We dance round in a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows. The Secret Sits podcast is researched and written by me, John Dodson. Audio engineering by Gabriel Dodson. Original logo artwork provided by Tony Lay. <laughs>